Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much just for the opportunity to be here in your presence and to know that you are faithful and we can have great confidence that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Uh, but God, uh, uh, through your finished work, there is a work that you have prepared for us collectively and individually to, to do and to accomplish. And I pray now as we head into this new sermon series uh, that we won't come down from the wall, that we would just be men and women who are steadfast in the work that God has called us to partake in, and that we will be men and women, God, who, who ultimately uh, just fulfill our purposes and destinies that you have so assigned for us before the foundations of this world. So, Lord, we just welcome your presence here, that you would instruct us in how we should uh, conduct ourselves every single day of our lives. Lord, we look forward to what we're going to learn together as we journey through the book of Nehemiah. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. amen. So, again, welcome to Commitment Church, and even those who are watching via Commitment Online, we thank you so much for uh, tuning in. So, I want to start with just reading an excerpt from a, a leadership devotional that I'm, I'm browsing through. It says this, God has prepared good works for us to do. And this purpose extends to every area of life. Igniting your leadership starts with recognizing that the place where you spend the most time, invest the most of your creative capacity, and interact with so many people, your workplace is a central place where God has prepared good works for you to do. God has a purpose for your work. Now, as we enter uh, this sermon series, it's so important that, that we embrace that, that the work that God has for each one of us is ultimately, one, for his glory, number two, for the good of others, right? But God uses you where you are, okay? So many times we want God to use us in some secondary place or okay, God, I, I'm waiting for you to do X, Y, Z, and then I'll start working for you. Or if the stars align, and, and then we're going to start, I'm going to start working for you in a particular place. Or if the door opens up for me, then I'll start working. The beautiful thing about God is that he takes your hearing now and uses it for his glory. You know, and, but yet the beautiful thing in that as well is that, the more beautiful thing in that is that, it, it then leads to potentially those things that he has placed in your heart. You follow me? In other words, he'll give us dreams and visions and ideas and so forth. But we try to many times bypass today to get to, to, to the tomorrow. And that's just not the way God works. God doesn't skip today to get you to tomorrow. Okay, it doesn't even sound right. But, but even from a spiritual uh, responsibility and stewardship and from a giftedness and calling there is the here and now responsibility to to live in today and manage today as a good steward and work in today in what he is currently giving you the opportunity to do today and that also is including the marketplace right it includes the marketplace but then also it it leaks into the body of Christ and the church. And I humbly believe that what you do in the church also leak where? In the marketplace and vice versa. There's not these silos that many times the church finds itself in. It's okay, I got this church work and I got this work work. No, the work is the work. And we have a responsibility to never come down from the wall no matter what the work is. So, so that being said, uh, the challenge we, we're going to work through today is is how do I then prepare for this marvelous kingdom work that he has for me to do today, no matter where I'm at, if I'm in the marketplace or if I'm in the ministry, if I am uh, a, a, if you were professional minister or not professional minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I still have a assigned work for me to do. And please underscore this as well. There, there's no... There's no age to this as well, all right? So you don't have to become a certain age to start doing the work, all right? And, and listen, there is no uh, rewinding of time either, right? In other words, you may be thinking you're aging out in the work, 
But no, you can finish strong. You don't have to limp across the finish line. You can run and sprint across that finish line. You cannot make up for yesterday. The responsibility is to, from here and this point on, finish well in what God has assigned for you as this work. So if you can open your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to answer the question again, how do we prepare for this work? How do we prepare for this work? Now, as you turn in there, just as a quick introduction, the book of Nehemiah is written by his namesake, Nehemiah, who was the personal cupbearer of the king of Persia, King Xerxes. Now, keep in mind the, 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 the importance of the cupbearer. All right, the, the, the king always had people who didn't like him. So there were always people who was trying to usurp his authority, trying to bump him off, literally, trying to poison him and so forth. So the cupbearer was a person of integrity, a person who could be trusted. He was part of this royal court that got, was very close to the king. Why was he so close to the king? It's because the cupbearer's responsibility, but you know what it was? Was to taste whatever was in the king's cup before the king tasted himself. Think about that. If you had a friend who says, let me drink that before you drink it to make sure it's not going to kill you, I will guarantee you, you'll start developing a fond affection for that person, right? Or there will be some kind of loyalty that begins to, you follow, do you hear the narrative as it's heading? Here's this person that God specifically assigned in the royal court to be the personal cupbearer to risk his life on behalf of a, if you would, a sinner to do saintly work. That doesn't, that doesn't even sound like church. Or what we surmise as church work. To literally lay your life on the line for someone who doesn't even follow God. Can you imagine if so many Christians got that in the marketplace? So this was a season when the children of Israel in Babylonian exile in the Persian city of Susa, about 444 B.C. Now, Nehemiah's biblical example you need to really grab a hold to is this, is that he was a lay person. He was just a regular follower of Jesus Christ. He wasn't one of the prophets. He was a servant of a king who was assigned to capture the hearts of the people of, of Israel or the, the Jewish people, rally them, to, them together and to build a wall in 52 days. Can you imagine that? To repair the wall of Jerusalem in 52 days. That should tell you something as well. How efficient, how focused, how you stuck to the task, no matter if you had your Sam Ballots and so forth, and Tobias, you know, reeling at you and trying to cause confusion. We're going to get to some of that in this, in this journey as well. But ultimately, they accomplished this goal which, you see, the end game wasn't the wall. You know what the end game was? Transformational lives, because ultimately the people not only built the wall, but their hearts were drawn back to their God. That's always the end game. The end game, church, is never the wall. It's never the work. When it becomes the work, chances are we begin to use people as stairs and steps that we hurt, we abuse, we manipulate to reach our goal. It's never about the wall. It's never about the wall. It's always about the people. The people's heart turning back to the one and only living God. It's the way it was. It's the way it is. It's the way it will always be. And God does not make exceptions. 
no matter how difficult people get, <laughs> no matter how painful it becomes to you and me, he never makes, he never makes exceptions. This is a biblical truth that is non-negotiable when it comes to the work of God. It's never about the work. It's always about the people. And the people drawing closer to their God. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, it says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, now it, it happened in the month of Chislev, is the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital. Then Hanani, and I, one of my brothers and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity about Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there in the providence who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, this is Nehemiah saying, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, I beseech you, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now day and night on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants confessing the sins of your the, the, the sins of the sons of Israel, which have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, not the statute, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the words which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. That's why they're in exile. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen because my name, uh, to cause my name to dwell. Verse 10, they are your servants and your people who you redeem by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. Isn't that amazing how he just singles that out? Now I was the cupbearer to the king. There's about three simple and practical ways for us to prepare, and they're nestled within the first, three, uh, the thir first four verses. The first is this. Whenever you are preparing to do the work, you got to first see the need. Listen to what it says. It says, there's a remnant there. They survived the captivity and they are what? In great distress. The word remnant means this, to be left over. So if you can imagine, they were leftover people. They were left alive, and they just were just surviving. They were just going through the day surviving. How many people around us that we have like that? People are just surviving in marriage, surviving in life. They are just left over, left out there to be alive. The word captivity means this, used to describe those captured in war and taken back to the conqueror or the conquering country. So they were displaced people. How many displaced people we have literally now in the United States of America? But we don't see the need. The word great means describes an intensity of or an extent of fear so there will always be people that, that it, we must see the need who are, who are trying to survive life. They are this remnant that God has called us to. They are they're in this foreign land, right? Literally or figuratively. 
And we have a responsibility to, to realize that there's some extent of fear that is happening in their hearts right now. They have a need. And the only thing that can cast off fear is what? Perfect love. And the only place you can find perfect love is where? Christ and law. The word distress means this. Adversities, afflictions, calamities, disasters, discomfort, misfortune. Any, know anybody like that around you? Mark 6, 34 describes how Jesus responded to the needs of others. It says, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And be he began to teach them many things. See, you see, so many times we want to do the big stagey work of the kingdom. I can just see myself up there preaching. I can just see myself up there ministering. <laughs> but honestly, you could probably say there was one time, two times, Jesus was on a big stage. Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Cross. Two big stages you see in Jesus' ministry. Sermon on the Mount. At the beginning, almost like launching his ministry. And solidifying his ministry on the cross. All the others felt the needs, saw the needs of people. The Apostle Paul uh, says this is the behavior of the church towards the needs of others. First, in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Didn't say preach to each other. Didn't say conduct a Bible study. How many times we even pass by our brothers and sisters who are in need? How, th let me think about this for a period of time. So how many times we do ministry because we want to do ministry? Because I'm called. This is what God has gifted me to do. This is what I want to do, make me feel good. Me. You, you see the pattern? Versus, no, I'm doing this for you. I'm answering a call because I'm thinking of you. If that is the, the motive, if seeing the need is the motive, there will be no one within any ministry at all, need to be reminded of ministry, need to be motivated of ministry, need to have any passionate message, passionate influence that comes from the outside in. It's because I see the need from the inside out. Then in Galatians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, the only, they only ask us to remember the poor. They only ask us they only ask us to remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. This is the Apostle Paul who wrote over two-thirds of the New Testament. Remember the poor. And that was the very thing that I, myself, was eager to do. Now, here's some of the consequences if we don't see the needs of others. The first is in Proverbs 21, 13. It says, he who shuts his ear to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be answered. You shut your eye to the cry of the poor? Or let me even kind of reword that. If you don't even see the needs of other people. You yourself will always be in need. If you can't rise up out of your ashes and say, you know what, 
yeah, we're having a tough series of years, but there's somebody worse off than me. If you can't come to that place, chances are your heart's not even ready to receive God's abundant blessings. Chances are. So it's super important no matter where you are. Let, here, let me say it this way. Even if, if you want to keep what you have, because you may be right now at a place of abundance, and you have it, and you're holding it, and you're taking it in, and you're trying to cause everybody to check these boxes, and you yourself are not saying, you know what, let me just be free with what God, is, what God has given me and what belongs to God, right? And be able to say, you know what, I see needs. Let me give towards the need. Eventually, your well is going to run dry if you don't. It happens all the time. A man or woman who starts hurt, Hurting and hoarding, excuse me, hoarding and hoarding and hoarding. Eventually, God simply says, okay, it's apparent that you have now become God over these things. And I now need to help you recalibrate your heart. It's very common. You look at any narrative in life with any person. Eventually, something just bottoms out. But then there's many of us who are in need right now and we're waiting for God to do a miracle. But we still can't look beyond our own pains to see the pains of others. And then we remain in our pain because our heart's not ready to receive more. The other consequence I found was in 1 John chapter 3. 3, verse 17 and 18, it says, But whoever has the world's goods and see his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in them? So it's kind of like saying to you and I, well, you can say you love God or you're in love with God, but yet you continue to bypass the needs of others. Ah, you really don't. You really don't. You're deceived. You don't. My, I'm learning personally that we, we, we should come to a place of maturity in our lives that God would inevitably cause us to deny ourselves to meet the needs of someone else. That he eventually say to you, you know what, there's something that you really want to do with that portion of wealth that I've given you. Or even that portion of time that I've given you. Uh, I want you to give it up to someone else. That's such a mark of, of spiritual maturity. That you're willing to deny yourself because that's the heart of Christ. Right? Denied himself, veiled himself in human flesh. Right? To die for us. That's such the heart of God. So if we really want to be like Jesus, there will come inevitably a time in our lives that he says, I need you to take from yourself to meet the needs of someone else. But we have to be willing to see this. Now, I, I'm also of the, of the humble opinion that if we don't naturally migrate to this place of maturity to see someone's needs, God would help you see. And one of the things I've seen him do in my life, and a lot for many people, you will eventually become needy. Then you almost have to look yourself in a proverbial mirror to see and feel needs. And then it somehow allows you to now translate in that into someone else. You follow me? You now have to be humbled uh, it's like the scripture says, you've received compassion, right? And now, now com share, uh, show compassion to those, someone else, as uh, by which the same compassion he has what? Shown you. Right? It's almost like God has to now break me down, make me needy. So now I'm aware of what? The needs of others. But I'm also of the thought, you see the scriptures, that he will command you to do something to give you the opportunity to do what? Do it. 
So in other words, if we learn this today that for us to be prepared for the work that God has for us, we must come to a logical uh, uh, place of obedience that we say, okay, I need to start being aware around me of needs of others. And just take it upon yourself to do thus saith the Lord, right? And then if we don't, then God has to somehow intervene to say, now let me help you see the needs of others. The preparation of the work is always attached to the willingness to meet the complete needs of mankind. It's not merely just physical, it's not merely just emotional, and it's not merely spiritual. But, but it's almost like this. You can't just only do the spiritual and not do the emotional and the physical and then call it spiritual. Nor can you only do the emotional and the physical and call it what? Spiritual. They're in sync with each other. The work has to always be, as I said earlier, about the people, not the wall. It can never be about the work, but it always has to be about the people. And, and what God is interested in is the complete man. Because when you deal with the complete man, you also deal with transformation. Complete transformation through the power of the Holy Spirit deals with a man emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And sometimes the church gets a little bit convoluted with that. Well, I told him about Jesus. I told him about Jesus. I told him about Jesus. But maybe that person needs food on their plate so they can not be worried about stuff so they can hear your message about Jesus. Maybe they need to sit down and have a conversation with you so they can have emotional stability and, and clarity before they're able to hear Jesus. But then there are times that God will say, sucker punch them with the Jesus, with the gospel. Just knock them out. And then they're ready to, you know, I mean, that... The, the, but you follow me? There's this balance in the spirit ledness that should reach all of the above, right? Someone comes to know Jesus Christ, they should then should become eventually emotionally stable. And eventually they should become financial, have, even having financial stability because God wants that part of their life too. He wants you to have financial integrity. He wants you not to owe man you know, anything, but to love them, respect them. You follow me? It's all in, in sync. So yeah, we could probably have like a final stewardship class that will reach and meet a person's need emotionally and physically. But it cannot be absent of the cross. And we need to know that the cross is all inclusive of what? Pointing people to get their finances in order, right? Pointing people to realize that, you know what? Your, your emotional stability is not in a person, but it is in the person of Jesus Christ. But we got to see the need. Number two, we find in verse four, the first part of verse four, it says, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, plural, plural, right? So let's look, about, look at this a little further, right? So how many times do we find ourselves saying, I want to do ministry, I want to do ministry, I want to do ministry, I, I, want, to do, I want to serve God, I want to serve God, I want to serve God, and there's no emotional connection at all. None. Right? And it's so, it's so connected, meaning that 
People make you emotional. Should. Should. And if you're not feeling people, hmm. when you see the need, it should then translate into, man, I, I want to now share in the sufferings of someone else. I feel what they're going through. Not, let me tell you about Jesus and tell you this Bible verse and and then you just, you know, you just quit having pain, quit having suffering, and, you know, just, you know, if you obey this and you connect all the dots and cross every T, and then guess what? Then, then, then you're going to be okay because you got Jesus. I heard these words. I sat down. And I wept for days. The word wept means this, to weep in humiliation or grief, to weep bitterly, to be well. When was the last time you cried over someone else but you? I must be honest with you, that's one of my gauges, my heart gauges. Because I went through a season of my life, I didn't cry at all, just period. I just, tear ducts, dry. Dry. And some of you know what I'm talking about. But one of my gauges is, is literally, well, when was the last time I wept? When was the last time I cried? Because so many times we can just go through the motions systematic especially if you've been walking with the Lord for a long time just I got this I can do it on my sleep matter of fact I can do it walking backwards you know and, and, and there's no sharing in the suffering the word mourn means this mourning over sin and judgment Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Galatians 2, bear one another's burdens and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. How many Christians, influencers, want to fulfill the law of Christ without bearing burdens? Just let me do the easy stuff. Like, just let me up front and preach. Let me up front and sing. Let me just go do, let me do, and there's no Wait. <coughs> Second Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions. Why? Why? So that we will be able to comfort those who are in affliction with the comfort with, with which we ourselves are comforted by. If I haven't gone through and I have not learned God's comfort, how can I even begin to comfort someone else? I remember early in ministry, I would have the privilege of... Um, you know, facilitating and leading and serving families who, who lost their loved ones. And I remember being with the families, but not really being with the families. You know why? Because at that time, I never lost anyone close to me. I had distant losses. You, you understand what I'm saying? cousin, you know, second cousin, third cousin, you know, just, you hear what I'm saying? But when you lose someone that you love, oh, now you get it. 
Because let me tell you, every time I, I have the privilege of serving families now, you know what it does? It takes me back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Takes me back and says, oh, okay. You know, you see, this is why I've learned even in ministry, after I got over my legalistic ways of doing things, is, um, and remember, legalistic isn't, uh, not being legalistic isn't putting down the cross, not following the scriptures, okay? But what I'm saying is following the scriptures. <laughs> All right, and I forget that I will sit down with people who maybe have been incarcerated, uh, did some bad things, and they're sitting in front of me guilt-stricken because they're in a pastor's office, right? And I never forget sitting with them and had this epiphany. And God says to me, you know what? You did everything they did, but you just didn't get caught. <laughs> you just didn't get caught. I'm like, I mean, it was, it, it, it totally transformed how I now serve people who, go, who have gone through things that got caught. And they paid the consequences. Right? You see, you see, we can sit in front of people and we say, well, you know, you, why are you watching pornography? Oh, you a sinner and you're going you to go to hell because you're watching pornography. Mm. I may not be caught up in pornography, but you know where my mind goes every now and then? No different than pornography. Just saying. And what the Lord has shown me is that, oh, Cedric, I, I can comfort you in this. I can, I can walk you through this. I can heal you through this. And, and, and you may not get to the place of public embarrassment, but don't you forget what I've allowed you to walk through privately with me. Is this making sense? Man, we have to realize that, oops, you know, God, um, I may not have been there, but God, help me, help me to connect the dots. Help me to connect the dots with the sufferings with people. Because if, it, if not, it just becomes works that has no fruit and works that has no transformational power. It just, it just becomes doing work and you're checking the proverbial spiritual boxes. Which does not lead to complete transformation in people's life. And that is, that's the religiosity of the, of the church. Is that listen, if I don't believe that I've been totally transformed by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ through the intimacy of Christ knowing me, how then can I believe and trust that God's going to do it in someone's life? How can I communicate that, that hope? How can I even exude that in my life if I myself is completely detached from it? All it becomes is just a bunch of Bible verses that we just communicate to people. Because it hasn't really landed in the, in the soil of my own heart. And, that, and to me, that's what I've seen and learned and, and even watching and studying people and counseling and working through life. Is that, dang, you can know it up here. But if you have not received the comfort and, and the impartation of this grace and this mercy and the power of, of Christ walking you through? Or if we become so spiritually haughty that we forget what he's walked us through. We, dis we disconnect from people and ministry becomes ineffective. 
We must first see the need. This need allows us to enter into the, the, the shared suffering of people. But we will always get to the place that you find in verse number four, or latter part, part of verse four. I was fasting and praying before God, the God in heaven. The then will always have to lead, lead to this practice of self-denial, right? Is because you can see the need, but will you deny yourself? You can even witness people suffering, but will you deny yourself? The word fasting means this, to abstain from food. It doesn't mean to abstain from Facebook, TV, food. Why is that important? We don't need Facebook. We don't need TV. You need food. And when you say to your flesh, you can't have food, game changes. I like to affectionately say, water starts smelling good. When you sustain from eating food over a period of time. But it also, listen to the word praying, it means to intercede. So it, it's rather than me praying for myself, but me what? Praying for you. Self-denial is, I got I to gotta move from taking stuff off my plate to put it on your plate, and I must begin to get to a point that saying, I won't because of you. That's the practice of sincere servitude, is that I won't because of you. There was no reason for Nehemiah to start praying and fasting, but because of what? He saw the need, this, that need birthed in his heart. He started feeling compassion towards the people, and the first thing he went towards was self-denial. What can I now do to start changing the course of time? Not what can I make the people do. What can I make the people sacrifice? How can I make the people change? How can I make the people get it? But the first thing he did was he went inward and said, okay, God, what am I to do? Second Corinthians 4, 7 through 12, it says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal body, our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life works in who? You. Man, we can walk around and say, I want to do whatever for other people, but it begins in you. It begins in us. Of course, Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite passages of scriptures. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives within me. And it's life that I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his very life for me. And then I want you to go back and read Isaiah 58. I won't, for the sake of time, I won't read all of it. Isaiah, you can read the entire chapter, Isaiah 58, one of the most Beautiful passage of scripture that says why you should be fasting and praying. Listen, here's just some excerpts. Verse 6, to loosen the bonds of wickedness. Mm. Right? Think about that. I'm doing ministry. And, and, and if I keep running into people who are in bondage, what is my tendency, human tendency? Well, you need to read this verse. You, you need to, you know, if you stop, well, if you, if you come to Bible study, well, you... All that's good, but that is not the narrative in chapter 58. It is, I'm fasting so you can be loosed. Verse 6, to break every yoke. Can you imagine? 
Can you imagine if we get it and say, wow, let me shoot for self-denial. Let me fast. Let me pray. Let me press in on God. Let me intercede on behalf of the people that I'm called to serve. Verse 7, to divide your bread with the hungry. So it's kind of like saying to me affectionately in my mind, you may not have any bread to give the hungry, but if you take the bread off of your ta- table while you're fasting, you now have bread to give away. Look at verse 7 again. Bring the homeless poor into the house. When you see the naked, you cover them. It all begins with self-denial. Verse 8, your recovery will will speedily spring forth. Verse 10, satisfy the desires of the afflicted, of, of the afflicted. Beginning with me. As I deny myself through fasting and prayer, all these hopes and dreams of transformational work in people's lives and communities, guess what begins to happen? The work, church, should always move us to a place of self-denial, which, interesting enough, will lead you and me into a sweet encounter with God. Right? Because it's all intertwined. It's all intertwined, right? It's like I need more of him, meaning God, to meet the needs of others. I need more of him to be able to serve you better. I need more of him to even help me see the needs of others. I need more of him to be willing to enter a place of suffering with others. And you can rest assured as you deny yourself in prayer and in fasting you'll never be the same again. Just won't. So so could it be that even your time of self-denial will help loosen your bonds of personal bonds of wickedness? Could it be that prayer and fasting will help break your yokes so you can break the yokes of others? If today that you may be feeling that, man, uh, you know, uh, even as I try to serve God, it feels like, man, I just have these bondages. I have these yokes. Seem like these things just keeps popping up, popping up. Maybe you don't start with seeing the needs. Maybe you need to far, first start with what? Self-denial. God, deal with my heart. So I can clearly see the needs of others so I can sincerely connect emotionally with others. I want to turn back to uh, this leadership devotional and this is some more of the content. It says this, most of us start our careers with enthusiasm and anticipation for what the future will hold. But when you add in the inevitable disappointments, failures, interpersonal tension and unrealistic demands suddenly work feels more like a jail sentence than the key to freedom a worldly view of work can have this effect on even the most passionate men and women the good news is we weren't just saved from the curse of sin and death we were saved for a purpose that includes doing good works that God prepare ahead of time for us to do, Ephesians 2, 10. It doesn't matter what type of work you do, provided it is work done for the good of others. The primary purpose for our work is to bring God glory. Whether you do chores or run errands, update spreadsheets or create marketing campaigns, lead people or follow orders, 
And as we bring glory, God glory, our work becomes an expression of love and service to others, no matter what kind of work you do. That's something, it says, to get excited about. Man, what is for the good of others and the glory of God, it's never boring, no matter what kind of work you do. Can you just close your eyes and bow your heads and just start this series off by asking God, where, God, should I work? How should I work? And remember, the work isn't only in the church. The work isn't only in the marketplace. It's both. It, it, there's no silos. There's no silos. Some of your, your skill sets that God has given you and you're learning and you're very, very good at, God wants to use that for his glory in the church. So don't shelve those skills that God has given you. But please, today, start opening your hearts to where and how. God, you've given me whatever it may be. Help me. Help me to use it as a kingdom work. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you just prepare your people for the work that you've called them to, to do. As we get deeper into the sermon series, Lord, we'll learn that the work starts where you are today. Help us, God, to embrace this truth. It's exciting to know that you use today. to affect tomorrow. In Jesus' name.